Okay, go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Cybersecurity Awareness Month event for October 28th, hosted by the County of Marin Information Services and Technology Department in collaboration with the cities and towns of Marin County. I'm Jason Balderrama, Chief Information Security Officer for the County of Marin, and I'll be your host and moderator for this evening. For tonight's event, I'm joined by two of our resident experts on cybersecurity at the county. Ava Rizzulli, Lead Information Security Engineer. Hi, everyone. And, and Nathan LaForce, Information Security Manager. Hello. Now in its 17th year, the goal of Cybersecurity Awareness Month is to provide everyone with the information they need to stay safer and more secure online. For the past few years, the county's information security team has celebrated each October by conducting events for our employees. This is a historic night for us, as this is our very first cybersecurity event that we've hosted that is open to Marin County residents. I hope you'll find the information presented tonight informative and useful. And if you'll bear with me for just a moment, I'm gonna share my screen. So just to paint a picture of why security is so important, I have some statistics to share. So first, hackers attack every 39 seconds, and on average, 2,244 times a day. So we see that attacks are frequent and ever increasing. 56% of Americans don't know what steps to take in the event of a data breach. Uh, and it's important that we arm everybody with the knowledge uh, as we know these breaches can happen at any time. 46% of organizations receive their malware via email. We see that email continues to be a top attack vector uh, for threats. And there's been a 715% increase in ransomware attacks from 2019 to 2020. So that is a huge percentage increase. Ransomware has been on the rise for years and continues to be one of the most uh, severe threats that we face. So on our agenda tonight, uh, I'm going to start with an overview of the county security program and actually open with a story about an incident that took place in the county a couple years ago lessons that we learned from it. Uh, from there, Ava Razuli is gonna talk about uh, security for distance learning and remote work. Uh, then Nathan is going to talk to us about email security. Uh, we will open up for questions uh, in between each section for anyone who wants to raise their hand and ask a question. And time permitting, we'll also have Q&A at the end of the event. So for those of you who may not have seen, the Marin Civil Grand Jury issued a report earlier this year highlighting some cybersecurity issues that happened in Marin County, both the county and cities and towns. Uh, so tonight I'm going to share some insights into the incident that took place that was highlighted in that report, uh, lessons that we learned from it, and improvements that we've since implemented uh, post the incident. So, to put this into context, the attack started uh, when a county employee received an email from someone that they trusted from the outside, uh, someone who was not a county employee. As we see from this diagram, the attack started first when a malicious actor uh, compromised the mailbox of the external contact. And once they did that, they sent several phishing emails uh, representing themselves as that person to multiple people. The county employee who I've labeled county employee A received the email from the attacker thinking it was someone that they trusted. Uh, the email had a uh, notice in it that they had received a shared document on Dropbox and prompted them to click on a link. The employee unfortunately uh, clicked on the link, uh, which redirected them to a fake Dropbox login page where they then entered their county username and password into the form. Uh, once they did that, there was no visible cue on screen that anything had happened. They weren't able to open a Dropbox document, uh, but at that point, 
the attacker had gained access to that employee's account. So we've seen in some uh, phishing attacks that the behavior is simply, they compromise an account, they take information from the person's address book, and they just use it to send out even more phishing emails trying to compromise more victims. But this attack was a little different. The attacker, uh, once they gained access to the county employee's mailbox, looked through the data uh, to see what information they could learn. And it was there that they saw that the employee uh, was someone who actually worked closely with people in our finance department. And uh, they saw an opportunity to try to scam the county uh, out of money. So in order to do that, the first thing they did was they set up an isolated email communications channel with the county employee B in the finance department. And the way they did this was uh, two steps. First, they changed the Outlook rules in the mailbox uh, so that any email communication between the attacker who was using the county employee A's account and county employee B were uh, moved into folders that county employee A did not readily access put it in essentially a hidden folder. So emails were going back and forth between the attacker and county employee B, uh, but county employee A was none the wiser. Um, the second thing the attacker did was they set up a forwarding rule so that any communication between them and county employee B would be sent to an outside account uh, so that as communications were happening, they could see in real time what was going on. Again, county employee A was none the wiser that their account had been compromised, that these email communications had been happening. They were going about their business and sending emails back and forth with uh, other county employees. Uh, so over about a week's period, the attacker continued to exchange emails with county employee B uh, and convinced them to wire money into outside accounts. Uh, county employee B thinking that uh, they were associated with county business when in fact uh, they were just going into the attacker's pocket. So you know, this was definitely uh, not a high point for the security in the county, uh, but we learned a lot of lessons from this incident and we've since made a lot of improvements I'm gonna highlight now. So lessons learned. So we know that in the realm of security, uh, we do have IT professionals who work on the technical systems, but equally important is educating our workforce and cybersecurity uh, best practices and have, knowing actions to take when there are uh, potentially malicious attacks happening. So what to do with unexpected emails? So there were some missed opportunities here. The employee received an email from someone that they thought they trusted, uh, but they didn't necessarily pause to think, you know, were they expecting this email? Was it something they really thought they would get from this person? Can they really trust the, the link that's embedded? Uh, security best practices for links and attachments. So this email contained a link and had they inspected the link, they may have noticed that while it said they were going to Dropbox, they were actually being directed to uh, an alternate site. Uh, password security best practices. The employee entered their county email address and password in this form, uh, but when no action was taken uh, and they weren't able to open the document, uh, they did not uh, stop and think that maybe there was a problem and they should change their password. Uh, the employee's role in security incident response. So again, uh, at that point when this activity happened, uh, they could have potentially notified IT, told them that something weird was happening. We may have been able to head it off at the pass. And finally, continuous reinforcement. So we've seen that while we do our uh, cyber education uh, you know, at, at least once a year as far as training, uh, we need to continuously remind our users of good practices and of new threats that are emerging. On the technical side, so we learned a lot of things too about the security of cloud environments. Uh, first, very important to have multi-factor authentication or MFA enabled. So had we had it enabled, even though the attacker gained the county employee's username and password, they would have had to have provided the one-time passcode to actually access the account. And uh, had we had that on, then that would have prevented them from gaining access. Uh, enable geoprotection. 
we saw looking back at the logs that some of the connections the attacker made were from IP addresses that reside outside the United States. So had we had that on, we may have been able to head that off at the pass as well. Uh, disable external email forwarding. I mentioned earlier that when the attacker hid their tracks, they uh, set up that forwarding channel so they could monitor the email. So having that disabled uh, would have maybe prevented that. Disable unnecessary features and services. So uh, in this instance, when we use our email, you know, we usually use uh, an Outlook client and we're sending emails through uh, a regular interface. In this case, uh, the attacker was actually sending the communications using Microsoft scripting language, uh, which is PowerShell. And we learned that uh, even though it wasn't configurable um, in the admin interface on our side, that remote PowerShell was enabled by default on all of our users. So had that been turned off, that could have also hindered the attacker's progress. And lastly, deep visibility into user system and network activities is a must. So we, while we did have logging and information available, we didn't really have a good platform to gain notice into uh, suspicious activities. And we didn't necessarily have a method of correlating the data. Uh, so we've since, since implemented a system uh, that alerts us immediately to potential threats. So some of what I've described uh, outlines the county's strategy for security, which is defense in depth. So just to kind of put this into context, we recognize that there's no one security solution is 100% effective against all attacks. Uh, so we layer on security in multiple points in the event that if any one system is compromised, then uh, we have a backup control that can uh, hopefully help prevent an incident. So for example, uh, the initial email from the attacker in this instance, uh, it made its way through our email system, but had the user who received it uh, been you know, a bit more fully trained and aware uh, of the potential threat, then they would have just simply deleted the message and uh, nothing further would have happened. So we do uh, multiple security controls um, throughout our environment to help prevent incidents uh, as they come up. So a brief overview of our program. Uh, so we have a very heavy focus now on security awareness and training. We have security best practice resources published on our internet site. Uh, we send monthly security awareness newsletters to our employees. Uh, we also conduct our own regular mock phishing exercises. So that way we get some insight into which types of phishing emails our employees may be more susceptible to, uh, statistics for each department, and uh, we can uh, augment our training where needed uh, as we see those trends. And uh, mandatory web-based training. So we do, uh, every employee in the county is required to take uh, security training on an annual basis. Uh, other responsibilities of the team, uh, from an operations perspective, uh, the security team is responsible for developing policies, procedures, and standards uh, for technology and for hardening. Uh, Security systems management and monitoring, I mentioned earlier, uh, we now have systems in place that can correlate uh, our logs from multiple systems and sources, providing us with a dashboard view into current uh, activity in, in our environment and alerting us uh, to potential threats as they happen. Uh, audit risk and vulnerability assessments. Uh, we conduct ongoing assessments and uh, do remediation where necessary to make sure our systems are not vulnerable. And security incident response. So as things happen, uh, the team is ready to respond and mitigate threats as they come up. Uh, I'm also happy to report that uh, as a result of uh, implementing this program and improving uh, our technology as well, uh, County Marin was actually recognized by uh, CSAC in 2019. Uh, we received a challenge award uh, for our security program, uh, highlighting its effectiveness and the fact it can be replicated uh, in multiple agencies outside of Marin County as well. And uh, finally, one of the newest additions to our program I'm very excited about is our Marin Informa Information Security Collaboration or MISC. So we now partner with the cities and towns of Marin 
uh, the security newsletters where we share information security best practices and tips with our county employees are now distributed to all uh, city and town employees at Marin as well. We also have a uh, portal set up where we have shared documentation where the county can uh, provide best practices to cities and towns so they can help improve the security of their own networks as well. And uh, with that, uh, I'm actually gonna pause. And uh, if there are any questions from the audience, you can uh, use the raise hand button, or if you're joined by phone, you can press star nine. And uh, happy to take questions about any of the information that was presented uh, now. Uh, again, we'll also take questions at the end. So uh, if you're still thinking about it or you wanna wait, that's fine. Uh, so I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, I guess we'll go ahead and I'll turn it over to Ava, who's going to talk to us about distance learning and uh, security when working remotely. So thank you. I'll get Thanks, Susan. Yep. Okay. New security challenges for a school in 2021. According to the recent report, 75% of school districts from across the US, they plan to operate via distance learning or hybrid model. The change from in-person to remote learning has caused new security challenges for school IT teams and staff. Our remote learning cybersecurity risk 91% of cyber attacks start with a phishing email. Also, bad actors target remote learning and communication tools such as video conferences and voice over IP to insert inappropriate image and manipulate the conference call. As you know, we are using more um, communication and remote learning tools for distance learning or working from home. Also, bad actors are targeting vulnerability in remote desktop application and services. Your IT team are using more remote desktop application in order to manage endpoints. Here is some uh, security incidents uh, for remote learning and working from home. So Zoom bombing is uh, one of the new incidents. Well, basically, attackers, uh, they get access to your Zoom meetings and they manipulate your meetings. So um, the way you can prevent that is uh, making sure you have a password for your R meetings and you're using a, um, a waiting room feature for Zoom in order to attendees to get access to Zoom, they need to get your permission. And also you need to make sure you, are, you install the latest version of uh, Zoom um, application when you're using Zoom for your desktop. Uh, Davis Episcopal Church was one of the victims of Zoom bombing. Another incident is ransomware attack. Ransomware is attack the attacker, they, uh, they, they get access to endpoint via bad URL or phishing email. And when after they got access to the system, they installed a piece of software. And through that software, they encrypt your data and then ask for money to decrypt the data. So Rialto Unified School District was, a, um, was one of the victims of ransomware attack recently. Another incident is phishing attack. So basically attacker, uh, they try to fool you through uh, a phishing email to get your um, personal information or sensitive information, you find your password. Theft of children personal, uh, personal ident identification information is another incident because basically um, our children, uh, they are working uh, they're, uh, they're learning from home and they have a um, school email address to communicate with teachers and other students. And it's a good target for attacker to pull them and uh, get the information from our children. Here is some cybersecurity tips for remote learning. If you are unsure whether an email is legit or not, try to verify it with your IT team. Pay close attention to website URLs. Always think before you click and teach your children to have the same habit. Don't reveal uh, personal or financial information via email. 
keep your devices up to date. Make sure you install the latest patch on all your devices you are using to get access to any data, especially your organization data or school data. Uh, update your password protection. Make sure you are using a strong password. Make sure you are using the password management tools and make sure all your devices are locked with passwords. If you need more information about uh, online safety, stay safe online.org. You can go there online and find more information. Okay, here's some cyber security challenges when working from home. Secure endpoint is one, one of the first thing for all of us to make sure uh, all endpoints are secure. Home Wi-Fi security and accessing sensitive data is another challenge. Um, Jason, later, um, after, uh, after me, uh, he will explain how to secure your home Wi-Fi. Patch management on devices not connecting to the net or organization network is another big challenge for IT team. Visibility and control of uh, all remote endpoints. Where you are at the office and you're working at, at the office, your IT team, they have visibility to your, your system because you're part of the network. But when you're working remotely, uh, it's harder for IT team to have control and see what's going on with your system because you're not part of the network. Uh, also, remote collaboration security uh, via virtual meeting platforms such as Teams, Zoom, WebEx is another challenge because we are using all these platforms in IT team and you responsibilities uh, to make sure these all that platform are secure for communication. Here is some uh, cyber security best practice for remote workers. Secure your home wireless network. You will learn from Jason how to secure your home wireless. Avoid the use of unsecured public Wi-Fi. Try to not using any public Wi-Fi network. Um, uh, if you want to use any wi public Wi-Fi, make sure if your organization is supporting VPN, connect to VPN. Because when you connect to VPN and you are using public Wi-Fi, you are adding another layer of security to your endpoint because Basically, you're connecting to your organization network with all firewall and other security um, tools in place. Make sure you're using a webcam cover because attacker, they can get access to your webcam and through your webcam, they can attack your privacy. So we are using all these uh, um, meetings and we are using our camera. So make sure you cover your camera all the time. Make sure your passwords are strong and secure. Never write down your password. Never share your password with anyone. And uh, because if uh, the, you are using your personal device and connecting to your organization network or data, um, you are putting your organization at risk. Because if you're using a personal device with no antivirus, no patches, and all these security things, you're putting your organization at risk. So please use only uh, devices approved by your organization. And I pass it to Jason to um, explain more about security, home Wi-Fi security. Thank you. Thank you, Ava. Uh, so before you go, uh, we'll take a quick pause. And I'm going to raise the PowerPoint again. And uh, if anyone from the audience has a question about uh, content that Ava presented uh, or from earlier, uh, you can use the raise hand feature of Zoom. Uh, or if you're joined by phone, press star nine. And uh, feel free to open up to ask a question. Uh, and not seeing any at the moment, uh, we'll go ahead and move on. Uh, so we're gonna take a, a break from PowerPoint. And what I'm gonna do now is uh, do a quick demonstration uh, of how to secure a home router. So for the purpose of this demonstration, I'm gonna use a uh, router simulator. And uh, please note that every vendor is different. Uh, every uh, device type is different. It may have different features. So you can't necessarily replicate everything I'm gonna show you here um, from your own device. Uh, this is just meant to represent an example. Um, 
and to give you an idea of uh, some steps you can take at home. So I'm gonna share this screen. And uh, hopefully you can see that. Uh, Ava, Nathan, do you, you see the, the login screen there? Yes, I can see. Okay, great. So uh, this is a simulator for a Linksys router. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start by logging in. So most routers have a default password. Uh, in this case, it's just lowercase admin. I'm gonna go ahead and plug that in. You'll see now that I am uh, logged into the router and I have various options available to me. So the first thing I'm gonna do is go to the connectivity tab. And uh, it's very important that you set your router to automatically install software updates because as new vulnerabilities arise, you wanna make sure that uh, your router gets patched uh, to prevent those types of vulnerabilities uh, from succeeding or if an attacker tries to compromise your router. So you see here that it is set to automatic and uh, if I hit check for updates, I believe it'll say it's up to date. Uh, so next thing is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, every router has a default password and you definitely want to change that to something else uh, because the manufacturer's default passwords are known to just about everybody. So if someone were able to gain access to your network, they could possibly take control of your router. So I'm just gonna hit this edit button and I'm gonna type a new strong super secret password. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit okay. Uh, next thing I'm gonna do on the connectivity tab, if I go to uh, administration, uh, you'll notice that both HTTP and HTTPS are enabled. Uh, so in case you're not familiar, HTTPS is the secure protocol and you wanna make sure that that is checked and that anytime you manage your router that you're establishing a connection using that method uh, since this is a simulator, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work properly here. So you'll see I, it shows a notice not secure up here. Uh, but under normal circumstances, I would connect to my router using HTTPS and then the link or IP address uh, to get into the settings. Uh, next, I'm going to go to some of the security settings. So most routers have a built-in firewall. And you see here that the default firewall is enabled and you wanna make sure that uh, you go in and make sure that that firewall is enabled to uh, add another layer of protection from malicious traffic. Um, next, we're gonna go and configure Wi-Fi. So everyone these days, I think is familiar with Wi-Fi and connecting wirelessly. So I'm gonna to go to this Wi-Fi settings. So the first thing you might notice is uh, the Wi-Fi name and it says Velop Linksys. So, there's a couple of reasons why this is not a good name for your home network. Uh, number one, it is the default. Uh, so you know, it gives some insight into what kind of uh, network you have. Number two, uh, it has the brand name. So if I'm an attacker and I'm looking at open wi or wireless networks that are available, if I see one that says Linksys, then that clues me in immediately that the device I'm working with is a Linksys router and I'm gonna look at uh, what kinds of vulnerabilities might exist for that manufacturer that I can exploit. Uh, so you wanna change the Wi-Fi name to uh, something other than default. Uh, I would also suggest you don't want to name it anything that could potentially identify uh, who you are or where you are. So for example, if you're thinking that um, using your home address as a Wi-Fi name, uh, not a good idea. So just for the purpose of tonight, uh, October, in addition to being National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, is also National Pizza Month. So I'm gonna go ahead and call this Pizza Wi-Fi. Uh, Wi-Fi password, again, we have a default password, password one, two, three. You wanna change this to a secure password. Uh, security mode. So this specifies the type of encryption so this particular device does support the latest encryption protocol, which is WPA3. Uh, you should always choose the strongest protocol that's available for your devices. Uh, so I'm gonna change it to WPA3 and I'm gonna hit okay. So another thing to consider, this particular router does support guest Wi-Fi. So if I go to guest access, 
So you think about it, uh, you know, these days, of course, because the pandemic, we may not be having as many uh, guests at our house. But if you did and they want to give them access to your internet connection, it's a good idea to separate that traffic from your other uh, network devices. So I would suggest if you do want to have guests, uh, you should uh, go ahead and turn guest access on and specify, again, a, a Wi-Fi name and a strong password uh, that doesn't hint at uh, that the network belongs to you, uh, that it is just another network that's available. Uh, another use case of the guest access. So many of us now, you know, as we move more into smart homes, we have smart TVs, uh, microwaves, copy makers, um, you know, digital assistants, it, the internet of things, as we call it, uh, devices that you know, maybe uh, behave a bit differently than our regular computers or uh, tablets and smartphones. So you may wanna consider putting your um, smart devices on a guest network, because uh, really they only require internet that makes sure too that it segregates the traffic if you're using your uh, network for home or for school. And um, realized I skipped one other thing and I apologize if I go back to, oh, sorry, it was in the wireless settings. Uh, this router happens to support Wi-Fi protected setup or WPS. WPS is a way that, uh, a device can join a network without using the standard uh, wireless name and password. Uh, WPS is exploitable. It is not considered secure. Uh, so if your device does support Wi-Fi protected setup, you should definitely turn that off. So I'll turn it off and hit OK. Um, this device also supports parental controls. Uh, and in this case, it's pretty limited. Uh, just you can set specific sites, uh, but you have to type them. You can also set time limits. Uh, so another way that you can do, if you're interested in content filtering, uh, and this is a little bit of a more advanced setup item, but I'll just talk through it briefly. Uh, so I'm gonna close out of this parental controls and we're gonna go back to the network settings. So there are uh, third-party services that provide filtering. Uh, one of them, which is pretty well known is OpenDNS. And the way it works is DNS is kind of considered the phone book of the internet. So when you type in, let's say, marincounty.org or google.com, uh, behind the scenes, there's a server that takes that name, it knows what the address is for that name and it routes you to that location. Um, so with DNS filtering, if you use a service that does some filtering, let's say for uh, adult content or malicious content, um, you can configure your router to have that filtering enabled by using that service. And the way you do that is, uh, again, an example, OpenDNS, you go to the site and they will give you their DNS servers and you simply put those values into the DNS settings on your router so that way, any device that connects to your network uh, will have filtering enabled and give you an extra layer of protection. Uh, and that's about it for the demo of a secure wireless network. Uh, I'm going to stop the share for now. And uh, once again, uh, happy to take questions. So anyone from the audience, if you have a question uh, about securing a wireless network or anything else, you can use the raise hand feature of Zoom or press star nine if you're joined by phone to raise your hand and happy to call on you and answer any questions. And uh, seeing none, I guess I will go ahead and turn it over to Nathan who's gonna talk to us about uh, the importance of email security. Uh, thank you, Jason. Uh, my name is Nathan LaForce, and I'm an information security manager here at Marin County. So thank you very much, everyone, for your interest in cybersecurity. As, as was pointed out earlier, it is everybody's concern. So the more you know about it, the better you are uh, prepared to defend yourself against you know, security threats. So I'm going to talk about email security and, and more specifically about what are called phishing emails. 
about how you can identify phishing emails and thus avoid a, a potentially costly mistake. A phishing email is one that falsely, re falsely represents what it is or who it is and tries to deceive you into taking an action that is actually a threat against your best interests. Generally, it's disclosure uh, of private information, but it also might be an attempt to install malware on your computer. So these, these threats are real. They can cost you a lot of money, and so you really want to keep, um, uh, keep your eye out for things that um, might be phishing, a uh, phishing attack, and we'll, we'll talk about how you can identify that in just a second. Um, but a phishing email, it might be, uh, might be an email that uh, comes across as a warning from your IT department that you must reset your password. It prompts you for input. It might be an email from someone saying that they want to give you money, but they need your banking account information to complete the transaction. It might be a warning um, that your computer is at risk and you must download and install a fix immediately. So those are kind of some examples of what you might have, you might have seen these in the past actually. So you want to be wary of these. And um, just a quick note about spam. Spam is not necessarily a phishing attack. Um, legitimate spam are, you know, just unsolicited advertisements or perhaps an attempt to sell you something you don't want or need, but um, they aren't in themselves. If they're just spam, they're not necessarily a phishing attack. So, but it's just important to remember that a phishing attack, I mean, um, can masquerade as spam. So you just have to kind of constantly be um, <clears throat> on the uh, vigilant. Okay, so next slide, please. <clears throat> so how do you know if, if, if an email is suspect? Phishing emails always have warnings and we call these red flags. Um, you should essentially, when you get an email for the first time, you really wanna just sort of mentally scan it for some of these indicators because it's quite possible they indicate that the email is something you really need to be wary of. Um, you, you might have to do a little bit of looking for them, um, for these, for these uh, red flags, but essentially every, every phishing attempt is going to have at least one of these, if only the action that they're trying to make you do, which is like disclose information or, or um, um, install malware or, or some of the other things that we saw on that list. So that's always gonna stand out is the action that they, they want you to take. It, it may be that an email appears completely innocent. Everything checks out. There's no sense of urgency. Uh, it it's, doesn't have misspelled addresses or anything like that. And you hover over the links, they look good, but still it's asking you for something that it really has no business asking you for. Might be you know, private information, financial information, health information. If something like that, uh, appears in the email, you want to immediately be suspicious. And remember, you can always verify emails independently. If you have um, a bank, you know, something from your bank, it looks like an email from your bank that's asking you for password reset or some kind of verification of private, private information or your account's been compromised, you know, some, some, something that you uh, might, you know, grab your attention right away. Just take a second, call your bank, Verify, you know, talk to someone from, you know, using the um, published, you know, um, banking telephone numbers and you can verify, talk to some, talk to representative and you can find out whether or not the um, email is legitimate. So there's always a way to independently verify whether or not something is, um, is legitimate. So, all right, let's look at some examples. Could I, could I get the next slide, please? So here's an example um, that, and we've got, um, the red flags circled in red, just to, then it shows you an example of what a phishing email might look like. You've got the sense of urgency where you must click this link. You've got the questionable link where the link that you see that down at the bottom as you hover over the, you know, the, the link in your email shows an email address that looks completely unrelated to what the, you know, the email is masquerading as. It's something about you know, pay friends. So you'd expect to see something like, payfriend.com or, you know, something that makes sense. You know, why are they sending me to this link off in who knows where when it should be simple? So look for that sort of stuff. Also, there's some misspellings here. That's, you know, doesn't necessarily mean it's a problem, but it's amazing. It's, it's um, surprising how, how often misspelled 
words uh, show up in, in phishing attempts. All right, let's look at another example, please. Um, here's one that looks like it's from Apple. But again, you've got an email, uh, invalid email address that simply has nothing to do with, you know, Apple. You'd expect to see something, you know, uh, an email return address from apple.com or there's also misspelling in that email as well. It's business spelled with um, um, a U where there should be an I. It's got an attachment. Attachments can be weaponized. They can contain um, scripts in them that um, are malicious. So you want to be careful about that. So if there's anything, again, you can, you can verify, you know, if you have a problem, if, if there really is a prob problem with your um, Apple ID, then you can verify. Just don't, don't, don't immediately click on something if you're unsure. It's always going to be better to be um, safe than sorry. Okay, uh, one more, please. Next slide. Um, so if you do have an email that's malicious, what do you want to do? You don't want to, definitely don't want to interact with the email. You don't want to click on any of the links. You don't want to download any of the attachments. You want to, if you work for an organization and it's your account with your, with your, with your job, you want to report it to the IT department. Um, some organizations um, have tools where you can actually report safely, safely report a suspicious email. It'll be essentially quarantined and analyzed. So if you have something like this, you want to make sure you know how to use it and use it. Again, if something's a legitimate email, it can the tool will, will absolutely allow the email to be returned to you. So you don't have to worry about losing the email if it turns out to be actually legitimate. But again, it's it's better to be safe than sorry. So you have other, if you're kind of on your own, you might consider, if you can of course delete it. You can also just block the sender out, things like Outlook or any, any email, um, program is going to allow you the option, you know, some menu drop down that allow you to say, don't ever, you know, um, allow these particular uh, send the, the sender from this email address to come through again. So you want to take advantage of the security features that exist in your email program. And don't forward it to anybody, because, um, you know, they might unwittingly click on something or not, you know, not be sure about what the best practice is. If you want to send something, um, what I do when I when I want to communicate about a phishing email, if I'm not using our our, our utility to report it uh, to system at, in our um, email system, then um, I'll always do like a screenshot. You know, I'll take a, a screen grab of it to say, you know, point it out. This is malicious. Be careful of it. We don't, but don't forward it um, at intact. Okay. Um, last uh, next slide. So uh, if you do click on something. Then there's depending on what you do, you're going to want to take um, a particular course of action. If you download something and you suspect that something's been installed on your computer, then you probably want to disconnect from your network um, because there may be some communication be between what you've installed and um, the hacker. So you want to also run a complete antivirus scan and attempt to identify it and delete it. Um, um, you can also um, down at the bottom there, there's that uh, visit to www.identitytheft.gov, which will help you with a recovery plan. Um, if you disclose private information like account information or possibly passwords, then you do have to really think about changing all of your account passwords. Um, it's a good opportunity to get them, um, make sure that they are, uh, your passwords are all strong, you know, 15 to, to 20 characters in length. Um, common common uh, way to do that is with a passphrase. So something lengthy, something you, you know, unique, unique, unique that you'll be able to remember it. Um, uh, so you can look into best password practices as well. Um, obviously, if you've given out credit card information, you want to block um, and make sure that uh, you reissue all your credit cards. And then another thing you want to make sure, this was mentioned earlier in the presentation by Jason, is that you want to make sure your email settings haven't been changed on Outlook or whatever program you're using. Make sure that no one, um, you know, uh, deceitfully put in some forwarding rules or out of office messages that you're not aware of, because those could be used to, you know, further compromise your, um, your internet uh, or your, you know, security. So, okay, so that's, um, I think that's my last slide, so. Thank you.
Hey, thank you, Nathan, uh, for presenting on email security. Um, and once again, we've reached a time where if anyone from the audience has a question, uh, you can raise your hand uh, in Zoom or if joined by phone, press star nine. And I see we actually do have one hand up here. Uh, Holly, please uh, unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi there, it's actually uh, Holly's uh, husband, Mike. Oh, hi Mike. Uh, good to see you. <laughs> um, yeah, my question is uh, actually about um, on the password front, you know, it's we have so many passwords these days that it's often easiest to have, even if it's a complex password, one for, for many things to log into. Um, whether it's our Apple devices or our PCs though, it's common now for the systems to volunteer suggested passwords. I've been leery of doing this simply because, you know, they're, you know, then I would not be able to access it, but I happen to be off of that machine. What's, what are your thoughts on best practices with respect to using the auto-generated passwords that uh, either iOS or PC devices might recommend? Thanks. Sure. Um, I guess I can take a stab at this one and then uh, I'll let others chime in. So uh, the passwords that are auto-generated, uh, you know, they are randomized and you know, certainly nothing you'd be able to remember on your own. Uh, I will say if you do use those kinds of passwords, uh, you know, what's very common today is to use a password management service uh, such as lastpass.com where you have uh, an encrypted database repository of your passwords uh, and you have a single master password, which hopefully you set as a very strong, complex, but something you can remember. Uh, certainly wouldn't want to use one of those auto-generated passwords for your master password. Uh, but I would say, uh, I think those are okay to use uh, as long as they are uh, you know, long and strong, I guess I'd say. The, uh, we follow the NIST best practices when it comes to uh, secure passwords. Uh, which really states, uh, you know, to use a long passphrase and, uh, you know, favoring length over potentially complexity, just because with brute force password attacks, the, the longer your password is, the, the harder it is to break. Uh, so I would say, uh, again, okay to use those, but I would store them um, using a service uh, such as LastPass or uh, another tool we use, um, just an open source password management utility called KeyPass. So if you're not comfortable storing your passwords with a cloud service, uh, KeyPass allows you to store a local password database that's encrypted and you can do your own uh, backups uh, of those databases. So uh, Mike, I don't know, did that answer your question? It did, that's very helpful, thank you. Okay, uh, any other questions from our audience? Okay, uh, I'm not seeing any other hands. So uh, I guess at this point, uh, that's gonna conclude our uh, session tonight. Uh, I wanna thank everyone for joining us. Uh, just so you know, this session was recorded and will be available on demand or will be available on demand on Facebook immediately after the event. We'll also have it available on the Marin County government's YouTube channel later this evening. Uh, I also wanna thank our County Board of Supervisors and our County Leadership and our uh, Chief Information Officer, Liza Massey for supporting Cybersecurity Awareness Month in Marin and also their ongoing support of our cybersecurity program. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And uh, remember that even though Cybersecurity Awareness Month is only celebrated uh, once one month out of the year, uh, it's our responsibility to be cyber secure all the time. And actually, now that I've said my closing remarks, I see we have one more hand raised. And since we have a few minutes, I'll go ahead and take it. So uh, Mr. Ali, uh, please go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Um, thank you for your very good presentation. I have a question. Uh, what are password management tools that we can use? Uh, so I'll say it depends on if you're talking about for work or for personal use. Uh, if it's for work, then I would definitely say contact your IT department, see if they have a tool that's readily available for you to use and that they recommend. Uh, again, for personal use, uh, I know there are services such as LastPass, um, which I've used and, and recommend. 
Uh, and again, if you don't like cloud services, you can use a piece of software called KeePass, which is free and open source and allows you to store your passwords locally. Thank you. Yeah, just one, uh, one last comment about yeah. that, um, just in, in uh, favor of using such software, is that it does allow you to get away from repeating the use uh, of a password for multiple accounts. You know, it's very easy for people to get into the habit of, well, I've got this great password, I'm just going to use it everywhere. Well, you really should try to use a unique password for every account that you have. And using a password management um, software, you know, basically relieves your, you don't have to try to remember all these passwords. They're stored securely and they should be easily um, accessible. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other questions from our audience? Okay, well, with that, uh, thank you again for coming. And uh, remember uh, this year's uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month slogan, do your part and be cyber smart. So thanks all and good night.